All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm David Yermak. I'm a professor in the finance department here um, in the crypto world. Um, I'm, I'm known for having launched the first ever university course, which then was about Bitcoin, but today has grown into something more broad about digital currency and blockchains. We've now been offering this, it's our 10th year, and we have hundreds of students across the university, and it's been the foundation of a much larger curriculum and programming effort of which this conference is a part. So the conference today is jointly organized by the Ross Institute in the Accounting Department and the Volatility and Risk Institute in the Finance Department. And I'd like to recognize our sponsors, Circle and Luca, and we appreciate their support of this type of academic event. Um, I understand we're joined online by as many as 200 people who have pre-registered from, I guess, all around the world. And we're looking forward to a very interesting program today. So I'm going to provide about 10 or 15 minutes of introduction and we'll get directly into the program. Um, what I want to do is just kind of set the stage by highlighting some of the important events and issues that have arisen over the last year, and two in particular that I think are broadly familiar to everybody in the audience. Um, we've been living through a period now, maybe 13 or 14 months, that's come to be known as the crypto winter, and many things have gone wrong. Probably the most important catalyst for all this was the collapse in May of this platform known as um, Terra slash Luna. So this was a decentralized finance platform. And without going into all the details, you could hold this Luna token, which was a risky asset, deposit it as collateral, and then take out loans in the US Terra stablecoin which as you can see on the top left was in fact very stable for a period of time. But the trouble began when really market forces began to drag down the value of Luna in the springtime. Pretty soon, a lot of the people who had borrowed the stable coin were getting margin calls because their collateral was no longer sufficient. Um, it turned out that much of the stable coins had been invested in other risky crypto investments so that they couldn't really meet those margin calls, which then made the Luna token more risky. And you know, one thing led to another, but pretty quickly we had a classical death spiral, as we call it in finance. And what I'm going to say about this and a number of other events is that we've seen this before. It happens to have been crypto assets, but these are not unknown events in the financial world. What you basically have here is a mismatch of currency rates that you borrowed in one currency, but posted collateral in a separate currency. This is the kind of thing that happens to Argentina every three or four years. And you know, we, we recognize this in finance. It, it happens to be crypto, but it's not really the fault of crypto itself. Now, the other big event, of course, is the FTX calamity that began in November. And there was a group of about 10 people who were barely 30 years old and set up shop in the Bahamas. They ran a investment fund called Alameda Research, which is kind of the thing on the right. Alameda had borrowed a lot of money of its own, made a lot of speculative investments. I think they may have owned some of these Luna coins, but if you look closely at the fine print, you'll see names like Voyager that you'll recognize as crypto disasters in their own right. And basically Alameda was facing its own margin calls. They had a sister exchange called FTX, which is kind of on the left part of the graph. And the FTX had one thing that was very helpful to Alameda Research, which was abundant cash. Customers had put money on deposit to be traded, and this became an irresistible source of emergency capital. Um, what happened was that money was taken from what was supposed to be customer accounts at FTX, and used to shore up the balance sheet of Alameda in the belief that everything will come back and no one would ever notice. And you know, if, as long as the auditor doesn't show up, everything will be fine. Now, of course, it didn't really work out that way. And some pretty good investigative reporting by the website CoinDesk kind of surfaced some of the reality of this beginning in the first week of November. And then a good old fashioned bank run began. Now, again, we've seen this before. This is MF Global. If you remember the small investment bank in New York run by John Corzine, 
after he was voted out as New Jersey governor. They made a bet on Greek bonds that turned out to be correct, but they ran out of time. They raided the customer accounts to meet some capital calls, you know, and a lot of things went wrong that shouldn't have happened. So the defense of Sam Beckman Freed, who is the um, genius behind this, you can see it on the top right, which is just that they were careless. Um, when they opened FTX, they didn't yet have a bank account, so they told customers to send the money to Alameda, and people sent them $8 billion, and in his own words, people People wired $8 billion. It's, you know, this kind of happened by accident. Like people sent us $8 billion and oh God, we basically forgot. So, you know, there were no basic financial controls or record keeping. And what's remarkable about Sam is that he's the son of two Stanford law professors. And even though he's now a criminal defendant, is all over the place speaking at conferences and doing podcasts and um going against you know, the very basic advice, which is you have the right to remain silent. You learn this you know, on the first day of law school, really. Um, the founder of Terra Luna is a gentleman named Do Kwan who is um, on the Interpol list. He's a refugee. No one quite knows where he is. The rumor is Serbia. Um, but he too is showing up on Zoom. In fact, you probably could have got him for the event today. He's doing a lot of Zoom defenses. It's, it's a very interesting time where things are going wrong, but the defendants have all kinds of rationalizations and explanations that at the very least are very amusing. So it may take a number of years to unwind these situations. Um, I understand we have some guests today from the Japanese Ministry of Finance, and you may want to grab them at the coffee break and ask them about the bankruptcy of Mount Gox in 2014, which is still nine years later, a very active case. And so if you happen to have put money down in these situations, um, that's kind of my point of reference as to when you might see some resolution, I think in terms of decades. So a lot of dominoes have fallen and what these people have in common is that many of them were investors who got caught in the crossfire. Many of them lent money to each other. Um, there is not a lot of transparency in this industry, but it's very hard to stay above the fray. And one of the ironic ones is the most recent bankruptcy, Genesis, which is a unit of DCG, Digital Currency Group, it was another part of DCG, Coindesk, that did the work that unearthed the whole scandal. That, you know, in the end, the, um, the people at Genesis were victims of one of their sister organizations. And far from clear what the recriminations will be, but I understand DCG is putting up assets for sale in a desperate attempt to recapitalize themselves. So, you know, what are some of the themes and takeaways? These are not that interesting in the sense that these are things that have happened in financial markets really for hundreds of years. So problem number one is that there's a lot of hidden transactions, uh, you know, assets and liabilities being shared and transferred across firms. This should remind you very much of Lehman Brothers and AIG. This looks in many ways like what caused the financial crisis and um, you know, the lessons should have been learned a long time ago by people. Um, you had the mismatches of one digital currency being collateral for another loan in a different currency. Again, you see this in the debt markets all the time. Countries borrow in US dollars and rely on their own currency to hold its value. Companies borrow in foreign currencies and then have currency mismatches. Um, again, we know how to manage this and it simply wasn't applied in this situation. The risk management in particular, if someone did you $8 billion, you shouldn't bet it all on crypto. It's, it's highly correlated. If one goes down, most of the others are gonna go down too. We teach this you know, in the foundations of finance course. This is not something you need a PhD to understand, but the unbridled aggressive speculation, you know, people just kind of fell into this idea that things can only go up. And, um, doesn't always work out that way. And then the fourth thing, of course, about mingling the customer money with the firm's money. If these guys had been a FINRA regulated broker dealer, they never could have done this, but they're not a FINRA, FINRA regulated broker dealer. And ultimately, I think you know the customers who put the money down and sent $8 billion or whatever it was to a bunch of kids in a playhouse in the Bahamas, whose fault is this really? 
you know, and, and who deserves the blame. So I think a lot of the discussion today will be about regulation and the politicians are beating the drums. And, you know, you were at the conference last year, we also talked about regulation. But what I want to stress, and I say this constantly in class, is that political regulation is not going to be very helpful here. It's, you know, probably futile at best. And I see three basic problems. Problem number one is that crypto is not run by people, it's run by code. That most of these assets are on decentralized networks with nobody in charge. And if a bank behaves badly, you can always approach the board of directors, the president of the bank and hold them accountable. You can't do that with a piece of software. This is a very simple point, but it's absolutely central to the design of this, that it's almost impossible to regulate crypto because it's run on decentralized networks. A second issue is that many of these things are abroad. I think Sam and the people at FTX probably violated many laws, but ultimately they were the laws of the Bahamas. And you know, for Congress to be up in arms and you know the Southern District to indict them, that's all just fine. But if you're overseas, there's probably a reason you went overseas, and it's often the law of the local jurisdiction, not our law, that may control. Now, Sam came home because it turned out that the jails in the Bahamas are much worse than the jails here. And yeah, I think his parents, again, could have advised him about this, but um, he spent, I think, about 36 hours in jail in the Bahamas fighting extradition and then realized that... Um, making bail in the US. And he's now, I think, restricted to the Northern District of California. But it, it's better. But I think a lot of these guys like Do Kwan are not going to be back in their own jurisdictions anytime soon. And a final point is that even if in principle you could regulate, it's not clear who the regulator is. Um, despite a lot of academic debate, these assets are not really securities as we understand them nor are they really commodities or currencies or anything else. They, they are a new type of property. And um, it might be nice for Congress to consider exactly who and how the chain of command should fall in a regulatory sense. But there's quite a bit of novelty here that people continue to struggle with. And I think you have to give a nod to the creators of these assets for developing something that is really outside the legal framework just about everywhere in the world. So much more to say about this today, but my own belief is that regulation in this industry has to be voluntary, that you likely will have people opting into codes of conduct, going for the high ground, trying to attract responsible customers, but it's really going to be self-regulation in the end because the technology is of a sort that you can't regulate this the way we regulate the New York Stock Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or anything like that. And I do think there are firms that have been trying to do this. Coinbase and Gemini and Genesis you know, would be three that come quickly to mind, but they couldn't resist the temptations you know, to take way too much risk and so forth. And they're paying the price for this now. But I think ultimately, you know, self-regulation is the one and only way that this industry will get its house in order. Now, the final note, and this departs completely from everything I've said, um, the, it's back. I mean, the best performing asset classes year to date are crypto. That since January 1st, there's been a huge rise in all of these things. You know, the crypto winter appears to be over. And, um, you know, the trains leaving the station don't get left out. So, yeah, we, we've seen this before. You know, the, the crypto winter in 2018 was worse than the one that we've just been through. And there've been, in fact, six or seven of these crypto winters so far. Each of them has been followed, of course, by an incredible bull market because this stuff is risky and very, very volatile. So I, you know, there are no guarantees, but I've seen this movie six or seven times before. And I, you know, I hope you guys are not too late. Okay. So this is my introduction, and my job now is to hand off to my colleague, Dick Berner, the head of the Volatility and Risk Institute, who will introduce our keynote speaker. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining, and I look forward to a good day.